In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. About an hour's train ride from New York City is the mother house of the Order of the Holy Cross, which I'm an associate uh, member of. And if you go inside the house, which is a beautiful structure, and you go into the sacristy, which is where they prepare for worship and all the holy items are, you'll find a safe. And inside that safe is not gold or silver, but instead a tiny little box. And inside that tiny little box is a fragment of the true cross, or so it is claimed. Of course, the problem is that there are many fragments of the true cross spread around the world. You can see them in places like Paris, Rome, uh, even, uh, even New York State. John Calvin uh, famously quipped, quote, there is no abbey so poor as not to have a specimen. In some places there are large fragments, as at the Holy Chapel in Paris, at Poitiers, and at Rome, where a good-sized crucifix is said to have been made of it. In brief, if all the pieces that could be found were collected together, they would make a big shipload. Yet the gospel testifies that a single man was able to carry it. Erasmus, a great rationalist in his own age, made a similar claim. And we even find this claim about there being so many fragments that you could build a house out of them in the tales of, uh, the, uh, the, of Canterbury, the uh, Canterbury Tales. However, interestingly, uh, in 1870, uh, a man named Charles uh, de Fleur uh, tried to make a catalog of all the known fragments, and he totaled it up, and he found that, that of all the known fragments of the cross, no matter how dubious the claims were on some of them, even then, if you were to gather them all together, you'd only have about a third of the estimated volume of the actual cross, so maybe Calvin was a bit wrong there. Nonetheless, we have a right to be skeptical, because we know so many of these so-called fragments of the true cross were just pieces of pine wood or a little fragment of, of here or there that was passed off by medieval merchants as being a relic of the true cross. But nonetheless, the historicity of the legend of the true cross tugs at our imagination, and we, we continually draw to that notion that there was at one time this object, this cross, which had this special power. So to give a little bit of history, you probably don't know what happened to Jerusalem after Jesus died and was resurrected. Uh, there was a big revolt in the 70s that was, in fact, prophesied by Jesus, especially in the Gospel of Mark, if you want to uh, believe that account. Uh, but in the 70s, there was this big Jewish revolt, and the Roman army came down heavily on Jerusalem and destroyed the city and killed many, many thousands of people. The historic estimates vary widely, but it could have been tens of thousands of people were killed. There was another revolt in 132, 135, and then after that, the Emperor Hadrian decided to basically level the city and rebuild it and to make it into a distinctly uh, Roman habitat. And so they built a temple of Venus on top of what was the uh, mountain of Calvary where they used to execute criminals. They put down dirt and they built this, this uh, temple to Venus. A couple hundred years later, after, uh, after um, the conversion of Constantine, uh, he sent his mother, Helena, to the site in about 326 to try to kind of Christianize Jerusalem, to find the objects that were associated with the life of Jesus and the, the sites. And so uh, she came there with the Bishop of Jerusalem, and they found this mountain where the this temple of Venus was, and they destroyed the uh, existing temple, and they uncovered the dirt, and lo and behold, what should they find but the true cross? There's a historical account of it. Let me just find it. Excuse me while I flip through my notes. Ah, here we go. This is a later account uh, of what happened. This is by uh, Theodoret around uh, 5th century. When the empress beheld the place where the Savior suffered, she immediately ordered the idolatrous temple which had been there erected to be destroyed, and the very earth on which it stood to be removed. When the tomb which had been so long concealed was discovered, three crosses were seen buried near the Lord's sepulcher. All held it as a certain that one of these crosses was that of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that the other two were those of the thieves which were crucified with him. Yet they could not discern to which of the three the body of the Lord had been brought nigh, and which had received the outpouring of his precious blood. But the wise and holy Marcarius, who was the, uh, the bishop of the city, resolved this question in the following manner. He caused a lady of rank who had been long suffering from disease, to be touched by each of the crosses with earnest prayer, and thus discern the virtue residing in that of the Savior. For the instant this cross was brought near the lady, it expelled the sore disease and made her whole. With the cross, they also found the holy nails and the, the uh, titulus, which was the, uh, the, the title that was nailed to the cross, and, and various other artifacts. And very early on, this legend started to attract people, pilgrims who came to worship at these sites and to worship these, these objects. 
so that by 380 even, we have uh, the following description from a nun named Egeria. So this is in 380. So by the way, this is a very interesting footnote. In the fourth century, we already have women's monastic orders, right? This is an order of women who sent one of their own, Egeria, uh, to see the Holy Land, and she wrote back letters, which we have. And this is her description of what she observed there. Then a chair is placed for the bishop in Golgotha behind the liturgical cross, which was now standing. The bishop duly takes his seat in the chair, and a table covered with a linen cloth is placed before him. The deacons stand round the table, and a silver or gilt casket is brought in, in which the holy wood of the cross. The casket is opened, and the wood is taken out, and both the wood of the cross and the title are placed upon the table. Now when it has been put upon the table, the bishop, as he sits, holds the extremities of the sacred wood firmly in his hands, while the deacons who stand around guard it. It is guarded thus because the custom is that the people, both the faithful and the catechumens, come one by one, and bowing down at the table, kiss the sacred wood, and pass through. And because I know not when, someone is said to have bitten off and stolen a piece of the sacred wood, it is thus guarded by the deacons who stand around, lest anyone approaching should venture to do so again. And as all the people pass by, one by one, all bowing themselves, they touch the cross and the title, first with their foreheads and then with their eyes. Then they kiss the cross and pass through. But none lays his hand upon it to touch it. When they have kissed the cross and have passed through, the deacon stands holding the ring of Solomon and the horn from which the kings were anointed. And they kiss the horn and gaze at the ring. So already by 380, we have people venerating this sacred relic. But things go awry for the Holy Cross after that in history. What happens, you see, is that you start having people breaking off pieces of the Holy Cross and sending it around the world to various holy sites you know, outside of Jerusalem. This was a way in which people could engage the history of the crucifixion now. They could have it brought to their local cathedral, a place of worship that they could actually reach. Then you have various emperors and, and, and uh, occupations that come through Jerusalem and carry off pieces of the cross. Eventually, a large hunk of it ends up in Constantinople, where it is later uh, sacked by the, uh, the uh, conquering armies of Western Europe and taken to various, again, fragmented pieces all over the world. Fragment after fragment is broken off of the two cross until at certain places you just see the tiniest little sliver, the tiniest little fragment of the cross held in a little reliquary here or there in some side chapel of a great cathedral. I want to contend, though, that in this tradition of the fragmentation of the true cross, we see something of its actual power because in the veneration of the cross tradition, we see something of the crucifixion of history. That in this act of taking this historical object and breaking it apart and spreading it around the world, we have crucified and broken history. And that in breaking it open, we encounter the God of transformation underneath. Because the cross is all about that kind of transmutation of history. We are a uniquely historical religion. We believe there is this historical event of Jesus, his death, his crucifixion, his resurrection. Those are historical things that we point to as anchoring our notion of what history is. In the breaking open of the cross itself, we see how that notion of history is broken open. You see those little splinters? I think those splinters become uh, transformed from their physical limitations and embed themselves as tiny little splinters in the heart of everyone who hears the story of that cross. That somehow that little bit of, of, of history gets embedded in us. Famously, I think some historians have said that, you know, that the fact of the history of the cross and the resurrection and the, the, of Jesus is a historical claim that we all have to make a reckoning with one way or another. That it stands in history as this moment of choice that we make. And if we open ourselves to the foolishness of God, we see something of the power of that cross to infect every human heart. So now as I commonly do, I'll open this up and see if anybody has any responses to that. Crucifixion of history. That's a kind of interesting idea. I'm looking at my historian wife. I don't know. She's probably going to correct my dating. <laughs> yeah, Cameron. Just thinking about the first reading um, and about serpents. Uh, like in, in my life, when I don't trust God <clears throat> and when I look elsewhere, when I allow myself to worry and to complain, in effect, that God's not delivering. Um, emotionally, I find myself in turmoil. It's like snakes, like writhing, you know, like it's a lot of motion and, and not very pleasant motion. And there is a kind of um, 
there's a distress, but there's also kind of like an emotional poisoning that happens. And it's only when I turn that back to God, back to Jesus who's entered into that distress, he knows it really well, and he has complete power over it. That's when it subsides. And I'm, I mean, for me, the lesson is keep your eyes fixed on God. Don't complain. Like trust and don't complain. It's very powerful. So that's uh, what the sense I make of that reading. Thank you. There's an old phrase that says, uh, the cross is the medicine for the world, right? There's this way in which the cross, paradoxically, even though it's this symbol of humiliation and death, also has this healing power to it, right? It's the same thing with, with that serpent kind of raised up in the wilderness, right? I mean, this is this symbol of death and weirdness and snaky stuff, and yet somehow gazing upon it, people are healed, right? Uh, in the footnotes for, for the first lesson, I had this thing about, you know, how that I found about how, uh, you know, God makes use of the means available, right, in these ways that we can hardly even begin to imagine, but the cross is one such powerful uh, medicine. Mm -hmm. Next. One of the things that struck me was in this account of this nun, Egeria, um, venerating the cross in 380, is did it remind anyone of what we do on Good Friday? You know, the veneration of the cross? That's where that comes from. Um, it was this repetition. Like a lot of the rituals that we do around Holy Week, it's actually a repetition of very, very ancient rituals that were done more than a 1,000 years ago in Jerusalem. It's kind of cool. <laughs> Others? Okay. Yeah, John. I was once in Jerusalem and visiting the uh, Church of the Resurrection, or the Church, Church of the Holy Sepulcher, as we call it in the West, and uh, was taken down to the excavations, the modern excavations, which tried to find the place where Helena claimed to have found these crosses. Um, but the far more significant uh, piece of, of that experience was actually being able to go up into the chapel higher up, which, was the, which is mounted on the, the top of the rock which is assumed to be the, the rock of Golgotha, um, and to be able to get down on your knees and reach under the altar and feel the, the face of the rock. That's when it really sank in for me this thing actually happened, and it changed the world. Thank you, John. Yeah. Jen. So I'm a little confused because in the Old Testament, we keep hearing over and over again not to have, not to worship things. And, and I remember as a, as a kid going to saint anne de Beauclay near Quebec City where they have a shrine there. I don't know what's there, but there's crutches all over the place. And I remember thinking, it seems kind of bogus. And <laughs> and and um, so it, I actually f I'm a little bit confused because here you're saying that 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 tangible evidence, and in some cases we're not even sure if it's a hoax or not, wh that that's important and that we need to reach out and touch it. So can you resolve that for me? Right. Well, that was, that was what I was trying to do with a, with a kind of synthesis of this notion of the, of the crucifixion of history and saying that in some way the object transcends the, the historicity of the claims that are made around it. Does that make sense? So in other words, the, the object becomes the thing through which we see, right? We, we see through that object to the underlying reality. And that the, the closer the proximity between that object and the, the history that we claim to be true about that object, like the closer that proximity, the kind of thinner that, that window or frame is through which we glimpse the divine. You know, it's kind of like, um, um, well, it's kind of like icons, you know, and, and icons were sort of, you look at them and you say, that's not photorealistic, right? Well, it's not meant to be, right? It's not meant to be photorealistic. Um, they're, they're trying to depict a deeper reality, and so somehow by staring into that face of that saint or, or Jesus or his mother or whatever that, that person is in that icon, we, we begin to see through that veil into a deeper reality. And I'd say the same thing is true about looking at something like the fragments of the true cross, that we see this human desire to reach through history to touch the face of God. And that we, rather than resisting that and saying, no, no, there's no, there's no use to that, I want to say there is a use to that. 
that rituals like the veneration of the cross, just like the Eucharist, have this kind of sacramental, lowercase s, function of connecting us through the physical to the divine. Mm -hmm. Does that help? The point you made, Jen, is exactly the point that um, struck me in the first reading. When, as we have learned over and over and over, thou shalt have no other gods but me, right? The snake is weird, and then all of a sudden, but the snake all of a sudden has these healing magical power. However, back in the old days now, a little further back than that, or, or probably a little further ahead, where they were worshiping the calf now, right? And that was, was not a good thing, you know? So again, like, I, sometimes that is really why it is important for us to really discuss these things because it becomes really complex to those, as we saw in Corinthians, the word of the God, Lord is foolishness to those who are not seeing. Because, you know, if we don't get this clearly, then first of all, we don't have a, a, a true understanding of how to how it means to us and and, and how we can um, you know how we can uh, um, relate it to our own life and and then articulate that to someone else you know who is not quite as strong a believer as we are right so those are the t type of things that are very tricky for me yeah actually I, I was like tuned out for the first reading because well sorry Mike <laughs> but <laughs> I was preparing for my reading that was coming, or the Corinthians reading that was coming up, and then, I, and then you said something, I heard snake, and I'm like, wait a second, and I actually flipped back, and said, oh, God said it must be okay. <laughs> so I was a little confused too, thank you, that I'm not the only confused one. Yeah. Okay, we are getting into one of the great controversies in Christian theology, which is the, the role of objects in worship and devotional practice in the lives of Christians. And Basically, I would say that, that this is an issue about which Christians have disagreed for a very, very long time. And, uh, you know, for example, in the Eastern Church, Betsy could tell you all about the iconoclastic controversies where, you know, which were all about, you know, is it appropriate to have icons as objects of worship, right? And, like, what is the role of those objects in the life of Christian believers? Okay, yeah. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> But I did want to mention some, just a little bit more about what's happening in the fourth century when Constantine the Great, who, to whom we owe, uh, whether we like it or not, the ability to have a church, because he reversed a lot of political and social and cultural things around Christianity within the Roman world. And when he sent his mother, Helena, to Jerusalem, to go on her archeological expedition, there was a long legacy already of Christians. There's, there was a lot of discussion about Christian suffering, being killed for various reasons because they were Christians. We're familiar with persecution. And there was a big question among many Christians, how can I worship God? How can I know who this Jesus is? I can't see him. I don't know what he looks like. I don't have any, any grasp of that history. And it was that desire to get, a, get in touch with history that really fueled that archaeological expedition. And in, in many ways, I think the theological point that stands out to me in that story is about the, the thing that we can connect with Christ is the cross. That is the relic that, that we connect with, the suffering, the instrument of suffering, something that we know so well. It's a human thing that we understand to go through pain, grief, humiliation, betrayal, all of those things. There are a lot of other legends around images and objects to do with Christ and his mother, other legends that tell us a bit more about maybe what Christ would have looked like, what the Virgin Mary may have looked like, and those are part of the same desire to be more in touch with history. But I think it's, it's fascinating to me and it, bring, it, it helps me in some ways be closer to both those Christians in the fourth century who wanted to know what Jesus' suffering was like, to know who Jesus was, that that's, that that's what they found. That's what they found was the instrument of his suffering. Thank you. Christians, or young or old Christians, just hunger for 
the knowledge of Christ so much that we create our own archaeological digs within our, our lives, you know? Nice. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 I, I, yeah. No, no, not too heavy at all. I think, I think we're going to have to end with this, though, but that's brilliant. I like that. Okay, so I'm going to revise my sermon notes to include that notion of, of this kind of uh, that, that history is also something that we undertake at a personal level and that we kind of dig within ourselves to find those, those crosses that are, that are there. That's a good one. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> Wonderful.